World. My name is Dr. Shaham Das. I'm a consultant forensic psychiatrist. I assess mentally disordered offenders for a living so that you don't have to. I was sent this clip by a dear viewer. It is Jada Pinkett Smith opening up about her battles with mental health issues, with um, contemplating suicide, when she talked to Steve Bartlett on his Diary of a CEO podcast. Um, I think it's a really interesting clip. If, because I'm a psychiatrist, I've dealt with diagnoses of depression and crucially I've had to carry out numerous suicide risk assessments more times than I would care to mention. So I'm going to go through this video, I'm going to talk about some themes. One of the themes is why do some people like Jada Pinkett Smith seemingly have everything that they could possibly want yet still get depressed? I'll talk you through how I assess the risk of suicide and why you need to assess this and I'll also tell you what I would do if Jada was one of my patients. Let's get straight into it. Leading up to your 40th birthday, mm -hmm. which is also where the book starts, mm -hmm. I, I read the first pages of the prologue and I couldn't quite believe what I was reading. Mm -hmm. Because the place you're at in your life, this chronic state of discontent that you describe, I, I remember when I got to the chapter 17 in the book, which is No Soccer Mom Here, that was the first time I had to stop reading because it was a lot, a lot for me to take. Mm -hmm. Hearing that that's what was going on in your head and your mind, that's the way you viewed life, you didn't see any path forward for you. Um, I suppose one thing that jumps out to me immediately is I would be thinking as a psychiatrist, what is the diagnosis here? So a chronic state of discontent sounds like dysthymia to me, as opposed to depression. So you all know what depression is, low mood, not just low mood, but low energy, low enjoyment of activities uh, in, in, like, in things that previously brought you pleasure, a lack of motivation, lack of drive, that kind of thing. Dysthymia is not quite that. So it's like a, a, a dampened down version of that, but it tends to be lifelong. It doesn't really sort of change or vary like, as depression can. Why is it important to make the distinction? I suppose because depression, you probably should treat and you can get treatment like therapy, like um, antidepressants, for example, whereas dysthymia, you can get treatment and you can get therapy, but it doesn't really necessarily work because it's like a car, it's kind of entrenched in your personality as opposed to a chemical imbalance. So that's the first thing that's going through my head when I hear this. You're 39 years old, um, apparently, you know, on the surface, it seems like you've got everything that anyone would dream of having, but internally there's this chronic state of discontent. Yeah. If I was, I often say to people, if I was a fly on the wall, but if I was a fly inside the walls. <laughs> yeah. What were you? So I don't know if I missed the joke there, but I don't, I don't get why that's funny. Anyway. What was going through your mind? 39 years old, about to turn 40. Oh, I was, I was in a very, very dark place. Very dark place. Just, I remember the line I read where you said, if I got to 4 p.m. every day. I was like, I made it. I made it. And even that was like so hard. I mean, you know, I was talking to my mother this morning because she just read the book and she said, I can't believe you didn't talk about how you woke up every day crying. Really? Yeah. And I was like, you know, Ma, I, I just, I think it was enough to tell people that I was looking for a cliff to drive off of. <laughs> okay, I'm going to stop here. <clears throat> I suppose th something that's a little bit frustrating about this clip is that I absolutely 100% empathize with Jada and I, and I fully believe that she felt like this, but there's no explanation to why which I think is probably one of the most interesting aspects of this case. But anyway, just to step back a little bit, I'm going to try and educate my Thank for Thor guys by telling you what could potentially be the reasons for somebody who on the surface appears like they've got it all, but could still suffer from low mood or depression. And I would put it into these categories. It could be a chemical imbalance. It could be genetics. It could be a history of trauma. It could be unmet needs. It can be pressure from society. It can be their own internal perfectionism and it could be sort of other rarer things so let's go through a few of those so chemical imbalance as i'm sure you know if you have a lower level of dopamine or serotonin then you're predisposed to depression so that's kind of disconnected or, or unconnected to anything that's going on in, in how uh, fulfilled your life is because that literally is just a chemical imbalance similarly genetic so as you probably know there's usually a family history of depression. So people, if depression, if your parents have depression, then your chance of de developing depression, even if your life is going really well, uh, is much higher than the average person. In something that, that could be relevant to Jada is a history of trauma. So we know well, she's, she's talked about the fact that there was domestic violence between her parents that she witnessed. Uh, her mother was a heroin addict, which I'm sure would have 
affected Jada's sort of sense of security and comfort. And she grew up in quite harsh environments, I think is fair to say. She grew up in Baltimore at the time, was and still is, like quite a violent city, lots of crime. She personally grew up in poverty. So again, there's a lot of, there's a lot of potential social factors that could predispose her to depression. Um, also, unmet needs. So I think this is probably the bit which is most controversial in that she probably has the least amount of sympathy for this specific thing. So most people would look at Jada's life and she gets a lot of hate from in the YouTube comments that I've seen from this video and other videos saying that, you know, she's got everything. How can she, how can she have unmet needs? And I suppose my answer to that is that people, people's needs are different, especially emotional needs. Like some, for example, Jada has, has mentioned that she felt that Will has kind of taken over their family life and their relationship and his needs for him being this movie star were always put first and decisions for the family were taken by him on their whole behalf. So I suppose what I'm saying is maybe she doesn't feel like she's got a purpose. Maybe she feels like she could have been more successful as an actress, for example, as Will Smith was as an actor. And also we can't obviously ignore the elephant in the room, which is the relationship between her and Will. Um, I think it's fair to say that they would probably agree that it's not at times or hasn't been recently a meaningful relationship. So there has been issues between them, isn't there? Like, I suppose um, you could call it a conscious uncoupling. So they've fallen out. They've been romantically separated and kind of joined each other again. So there's, what I'm saying is there's a problem in that relationship. So maybe she doesn't feel appreciated. Maybe she doesn't feel loved. Maybe she doesn't feel that she's kind of reaching her potential in terms of being an actress and, and being a celebrity, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, another issue would be pressure. So different, so there could be external pressure for her to maintain this perfect image or uh, maintain this like this 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 image of that everything is is absolutely perfect and that there's nothing for her to be sad about. So I suppose what I'm saying is there's a slight irony in that people who seem to have everything in the outside world. I'm not just talking about Jada. Let's say I don't know successful businessman or woman. They might see it as a weakness if. They crumble, uh, they crumble under this lifestyle and under the pressure. So they don't want other people outside to see that they're struggling. So if you and I are struggling, we can maybe speak to a therapist. We can maybe, you know, speak to our friends about it. But somebody like Jada might think, well, I don't want other people to know because people are just going to judge me because it looks like everything's perfect. So I can't tell people because people could tell other people and rumours can spread, etc., etc. And then I suppose that's an external force. There's the internal personality traits. So if you're a perfectionist, if you've got a critical inner voice, then even though you seem to have everything in going well for you in your life, you might focus on the negative. So you can have like a pessimistic outlook or you can have negative cognitions. And I think it's probably fair to say that most celebrities, especially those that are in competitive fields, like potentially actresses or sportsmen, they must have some sort of inner drive. So they probably do have a degree of perfectionism, a degree of, of hyper self-criticism as well. So it's not just a random personality trait. It's over um, exposed within celebrities, I think. All right, back to the video. Oh. And what she brought up was like, she knew I was unhappy, but she didn't know why. So it wasn't that people around me didn't know that I was really unhappy. It's just that everybody believed what I believed, which is why it was so hard for me to talk about, which is like, you've got everything. What are you unhappy about? Right? And so that's how I was feeling. You've got everything. What are you unhappy about? And that was just, I had so much shame around that because I didn't understand. And even then, there wasn't a lot of conversation around mental health. And so I was just like, fuck it. I can't keep doing this. I went out. And it was just a really, really dark time. So my interpretation of what Jade is saying is that maybe there wasn't any identifiable reason that she was feeling like this. She was feeling low. I mean, if she's waking up crying every morning, then to me, that is clinical depression that's not dysthymia so maybe there is no answer maybe it's just a feeling that she got and she's just not happy internally when you say you were looking for a cliff to drive off of you're not saying that theoretically or as a metaphor no i'm saying i was looking to the point where i was like big sir i knew exactly the route to drive and it's this really narrow route and sometimes it gets really foggy there at night and you i'm not i'm not making it out of that out of that drop 
I, I remember driving that one time, going to Big Sur, because I was looking like here, like on Mulholland. I was like, these drops aren't going to, like, I need a drop that I'm not making it back. I don't want to be disfigured. I don't want, I want out. And I knew I had to make it look like an accident because I did not want my kids to think that I had committed suicide. Okay, so, you know, listening to this, not even as a psychiatrist, but as a human, it's, it's, um, it's really concerning, isn't it? Like, I know that she's got a lot of haters and I think some people don't take her very seriously or don't necessarily believe her mental health issues, I think it's fair to say, according to some of the comments. But, I mean, she's clearly somebody that is upset. She's suffering. She's almost at the edge of tears here. And what she's describing is a really risky kind of scenario. So... I'm going to step back and I'm going to talk about suicide risk assessments. So this is like the bed, bread and butter of what a lot of psychiatrists do. Uh, it's usually something that we have to know how to do efficiently throughout our training because no matter what field of psychiatry you're in, potential risk of suicide within our patients is a real threat. So first of all, why do we need to decide whether how danger, how close to suicide an individual is? Like another way of asking that question, if somebody says they're suicidal, isn't that enough? Shouldn't you believe them? The answer is more complicated than that because we have to make the distinction between people that come in who are threatening suicide but are probably not going to do it versus people who are actually acutely at dangerous of suicide. And the reason is this, is because we need to make a judgment call about whether they need to go to hospital if necessary to be sectioned against their will. So when I was a junior doctor, I would work in a liaison psychiatry in a very busy accident emergency department in central London and suicide attempts were very common probably see on average something like two or three every single night and we had to decide which one of those need to be sectioned now if you get it wrong and you section somebody who is actually not at that high risk of suicide then you're really impinging on their life you're sending them to a psychiatric unit and they probably don't want to be there they don't need to be there they might not have a particularly good experience of being there i think it's fair to say it kind of it could damage their um their ability or their um, their motivation to seek help for mental health issues in the future. So it's potentially very damaging. But even worse, if you get it wrong and there is somebody who's at risk of killing themselves, then obviously if you release them, they could literally go out and kill themselves. And that happens. That happens in all psychiatrists' careers. So that's why it's important to differentiate between the people who are actually high risk versus those who are low risk. So it's not about whether you believe them or not. It's about understanding the difference. So how do you do it? So when I assess for suicide risk, I first, I first of all look at things like demographics. So a male, a male in their 40s or 50s who is unemployed, who is a drinker, who has like recently gone through a divorce, for example, who has a mental illness like schizophrenia, all of these things are massive, massive red flags. So more, the more of those risk factors you had, the more alarm bells should be ringing in your head that statistically this person is more at risk of suicide. Then separate from the demographics, you look at recent life, event, life events, like I mentioned divorce, so you know, any kind of major life issue is going to pre predispose somebody to suicide. For Jada, there doesn't seem to be a specific precipitant, it's more like a, a background feeling. And then finally, there's, there's the thoughts and behaviours. So for example, uh, a, a case that I might have seen when I was working in liaison psychiatry fairly commonly would be like a young female who comes in with an overdose. I'm not necessarily concerned about their risk of suicide because they've done it in the context of trying to upset somebody like a relationship breakdown. They've taken a small overdose, for example. So there's lots more tablets available, but they only took, say, 10 paracetamol. They called the ambulance themselves. So they obviously wanted some intervention or they called their boyfriend or their mother, et cetera, et cetera. And they didn't leave a suicide note. So I just want to be crystal clear. Again, I'm not saying that we should dismiss this person. They don't need any, any help or treatment. They absolutely do need some kind of um, some kind of input or insight into their life or something needs to change. So I, I'm not dismissing them as attention seekers and I don't want to help them. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is they don't need to be sectioned now against their will because they're not at a high risk of suicide. But take it back to what Jada was saying. That's actually really concerning because this is not like a fleeting thought of I wish I was dead, which is actually very, very common. Uh, and very rarely leads to suicide. This is actual intentions and plans. She's driving around. She's made kind of um, specific inquiries about the best place to, to end her own life. I'd be looking at other activities. So if she's kind of tying up loose ends, writing letters to people to say goodbye, these would be extremely concerning. So I don't think it's that concerning now that she's talking about to Stephen Bartlett about it. But at that time, there was a certain finality to her presentation, which would uh, bother me as a psychiatrist. All right, back to the video. I was, I was, yeah, 
I was in a lot of pain. I was in a really, really dark place. And when you're in that place, you just can't see your way out. And you really think, I really thought something was really wrong with me because what I was feeling wasn't matching the exterior of my life. So I really did feel like I, I was just born broken. And I was just wired in a way that just... What was the truth? If that's how you felt, what was, in hindsight now, what do you know to be the truth of that emotion and that state of your life, 39, 40 years old? What was actually going on? That I really feel like that sometimes when we get into these states of wanting to die, you know, for those of us who have had like suicidal thoughts and what have you, sometimes it is chemical. That's a different thing. I think mine was more psychological. Something is asking to die, but not you. And it's a, it's, it's a different way of looking at things, right? And so and it's, it, is a, it is an extreme shift in which I had to get out of my cycle of self-hatred. I was in a cycle of self-hatred that I didn't even know. Because we're unconscious. A couple of things jump out to me. First of all, she said, something inside you wants to die, but it's not you. I'm not entirely sure what she means by that. Maybe it's like for sore guys and gals, you can explain your interpretation in the Shemamish section below. So she could mean that she, that, yeah, I think she means that it's, it's something that she doesn't recognize, like a force in her that wants her life to end, but it feels separate to the rest of her which I suppose is a slightly comforting sign because it means that she's able to disconnect that part that's kind of motivated to, to take her own life. And she recognizes this is, this, is not, this is not in tune with the rest of her psyche. So that's something, there's something else she said. I'm just gonna go back a bit. Extreme shift in which I had to get out of my cycle of self-hatred. I was in a cycle of self-hatred that I didn't even know. So yeah, that was it. It's very common for people with depression to have negative cognition. So self-hatred is one thing. Guilt, either real or imagined or sort of exaggerated is another thing. So for example, I've seen patients, women who have not been particularly attentive as mothers because they're suffering from this depression. They don't have the kind of drive and energy to, to do much for their kids. And then they feel this sort of cycle of self-hatred and guilt, pessimism about the future. So never thinking that things are going to improve. So all of these things can maintain and kind of send you into a spiral where they are symptoms of your depression, but they also worsen your depression. So it just, it just keeps getting worse and worse. Because we're unconscious of it. So the mind is tricking us, you know what I mean? We gotta be careful with this. This isn't as reliable as we think, you know? And so, um, but I was, in a, I was in a cycle of self-hatred and it wasn't until, thank God for my son, that I was, you know, he introduced me. Um, his friend's father did ayahuasca and they happened to be talking about it and they talked to me about it. Jaden came in the kitchen. He's like, you got to sit down with Moises and Mateo. You got to hear about this experience, Ma, that their dad had. Was Jaden saying that intentionally? Did he know that you needed No, that? he wasn't saying that. He was just curious. He was just, he knows I'm curious. He knows I'm a seeker. Right. 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 That was divine. And so I went and talked to them and I was like, hey, is your dad in town? And then their dad came and I talked to him and he, I was like, I need that. And then the universe opened up a door for me to have my own ceremony. Four days of like intense, tense ceremony. But that's when I got to see that cycle of self-hatred. I was like, this is you. These are your thoughts. This is how you feel about yourself. This is the problem. And so the medicine really showed me this pit self-hatred I was in and it so <laughs> I'm not sure what to say about this as a psychiatrist I would never recommend that in my patients do ayahuasca I think obviously it can have potential benefits and it can be it can help people sort of self-reflect obviously otherwise people wouldn't do it right and in this particular case it has helped Jada so she was when she went through the ceremony she was she obviously went to some sort of spiritual plane reflected 
on her own personal kind of emotional weaknesses and realised she was in the cycle of self-hatred. So in this particular case, it helped, and I'm glad it helped. But I would be very worried of sending somebody with poor mental health and suicidal thoughts to do something as mind-blowing as psychedelics because there's a risk that the opposite could happen. So there's a risk that they could focus on this self-hatred instead of understanding it and trying to separate away from it, the opposite could happen. So for example, it's no secret that, and I'm sure some of my psych, psych for Soul guys and gals can uh, attest to this, and maybe I can, maybe I can't, no comment. Uh, but if you're naturally paranoid and you take psychedelics, either you're naturally paranoid in your personality or you don't feel comfortable in the situation for whatever reason, then that can massively spiral. It can actually become much, much worse, which is why you have to be, or you should be really, really comfortable when you're taking these kind of trips. So suppose the point I'm trying to make is, is even if the person's physically comfortable, if they have these mental health hangups, there's, there's a huge risk in doing something like this that it could actually tip you over the edge and make you worse. Again, didn't happen in Jada's case, which I'm happy about, but um, it's a risk. B, get out of it. Chapter 20 of the book, you, you titled Surrender. Yeah. Surrender is an interesting word. Why is surrender so important in your journey? You have to surrender everything you think you are and everything you think you know. I've spoken to a lot of people that have done Alcoholics Anonymous and they talk about the importance surrender, of surrender. Yeah. It's like surrendering, you know, for me, also surrendering to a, power, a higher power. Mm. And that's a constant. That's every day. I have to remind myself and deepen my surrender to a power far greater than myself. If you love the driver CEO brand and you want... All right, chill out, Steve. Stop bringing yourself up. Um, so, yeah. Again, the really interesting video, and, and I feel for Jada, and I'm glad she's in a better place now. I have to say, as a psychiatrist and as a YouTuber that's trying to analyse what she's saying, it's frustrating because it seems that she touched on some topics but didn't really explain them. And those were the core things that I, presumably you, really want to know about. So to be specific... She never really explained what the cause was for her depression. It could be that there was no cause. Maybe there's, there's literally nothing that she can consciously think of that she's kind of missing from her life or that needs to be corrected, um, which is which is very possible. Or maybe she didn't feel comfortable saying it during the interview, but it's just frustrating that she talked around the subject but didn't actually explain what she thought was missing, number one. Number two, that bit at the end, surrender. What did she mean? Surrender to what? I mean, she said a higher power, but that it would have been helpful to know uh, if anybody's in this situation, what did she surrender to? What exactly did she do? How did she get better? So again, there was no detail. There's no con. I, I wanted to know the content behind what she was talking about. Anyway, moving tact, I'm going to answer the question, what would I do if Jada Pinkett Smith was my patient, if she'd come to see me? The first thing I do, and I alluded to this before, is I do a suicide risk assessment to see if she's safe to be returned back home in the community. Obviously now she's speaking about it with insight. She's managed to heal, self-heal to a degree using ayahuasca. So now, absolutely, I'm, I'm convinced that, that she's safe. But at the time that she was going around driving for cliffs, I think I might have sectioned her, you know? If she presented saying that she'd done that, I might have been really worried that if I let her go, that, you know, she would go and do something drastic. Uh, but in terms of a treatment now, I absolutely wouldn't prescribe any antidepressants because I think that this isn't a chemical imbalance, but it's more likely uh, something to do with a lack of purpose or something's lacking in her life. The very first thing I try and figure out is exactly what is it that's lacking? What is she missing? She's alluded to something being missing and not being happy, uh, happy but we need to know what because you can't treat a problem if you don't diagnose it first. Maybe she is not fully conscious about what it is. So maybe she needs to kind of think more and explore her own kind of background and her own thoughts. She needs to know what's missing before she can work through it with a therapist. But that's what I'd do. I'd explore that in therapy. Also, I suppose something else that's quite uh, exclusive or unique to Jada Pinkett Smith compared to the average typical quote unquote typical patient is the fact that she gets all this attention, is the fact that she gets so much hate. And she didn't talk about it in this video, but I do wonder whether... She's affected by this backlash, by people sort of publicly slagging her off, by negative YouTube comments. You know, obviously she's somebody who puts herself out there. She has this red table talk. She even has Will Smith on it. And they talk quite openly about relationship difficulties. Is that helpful? Like the answer is it could be or it couldn't be. So it could be that it's quite cathartic and she likes, you know, having this channel, this platform to talk about it all, in which case absolutely keep going for it. But it's also quite possible that despite the fact that she's doing it, it could be quite harmful for her to put her own sort of dirty laundry out there and the negative hate. So I would 
I would make her, th- I wouldn't decide for her because it's ultimately her choice, but as her psychiatrist, I would ask her to reflect on whether it's helpful or whether it's damaging. And then finally, I'd look at her relationship with Will. I'm not going to slag off a couple who I don't, I, don't, I don't know anything about personally, but I think it's fair to say that there are issues there. So they need to make a decision. Are they on? Are they off? Are they helpful? Is their relationship helpful for, for both of their mental health? And that's basically it. That's all I have to say. I implore you to subscribe to this channel because not only would it help me out immeasurably, but it means that you will not get any red lights in traffic when you're driving to work. You won't be late. Guaranteed all your money back. I make these videos to educate you so you can start thinking like a forensic psychiatrist and also to take over the world, although it's not going great. Go and watch my other videos. Let me know if there are other videos you want me to react to. I'll put some links down into interesting videos about suicide, etc., etc., that I've made in the past. Until then, have a blessed day. Happy Hanukkah and Merry Christmas. And do not forget, I love you.